<clears throat> good morning to those of you who are in the United States and good afternoon to those joining us from Europe um, or elsewhere. My name is Jeff Rathke. I'm the president of the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies. And it's a real uh, pleasure to welcome uh, so many of you around the world to this discussion, uh, which we have given the title, Reluctant Followers, Germany, Japan, and the Future of International Order. <clears throat> the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies is uh, proud to have with us today two uh, renowned experts uh, on these questions. Um, uh, Gail Maddox, my colleague, director of our program on foreign and security policy, will do the introductions. But let me just say um, how glad uh, I am to have Hans Mal uh, with us uh, today. We are also glad to do this event in partnership with the Robert Bosch Alumni Association, uh, and we are grateful for that uh, relationship. So with that, um, and uh, knowing that uh, we have limited time today, uh, let me just say that the questions of international order and the role that America's closest allies play in that order uh, are among the most important uh, matters for uh, the transatlantic community, for the United States with its international relationships uh, in the Asia Pacific and around the world. And uh, so this is a very timely discussion uh, and it builds uh, on work that uh, both of our panelists have done for decades uh, on questions of international order. Uh, and uh, I'm really excited to get into so, Gail, let me hand the floor over to you, and we'll get started. Thank you so much, Jeff. <clears throat> good morning and good afternoon. And, uh, and I'd like to also greet our two speakers, uh, Hans Mao and um, Mike Muchisuki, and, um, and start us a little bit on, uh, on this, what will, promises to be a very interesting conversation. Um, why Germany and Japan? Well, obviously, we're the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies. Uh, the countries are thousands of miles apart with clear differences geopolitically, but their histories have striking similarities, of course. And, they're, um, and they have over 70 years uh, of uh, U.S. support as close allies. They're both challenged challenged by uh, major U.S. competing powers, uh, Russia and China. Uh, their domestic populations are, are pacifistic, and the development of their militaries has been uh, gradual uh, to differing degrees. Uh, but they're both at a point where they could, make, where they could take any number of paths uh, in the future with tremendous impact on the United States uh, and on the international order. Uh, on that note, uh, I just uh, would uh, hope that they will talk about how could uh, the international order actually look and uh, what will be the future roles, of course, of Germany and of Japan uh, in that order. Um, so it's with great pleasure that I turn first and foremost to, uh, uh, to Hans Mao uh, on Germany. And he will speak on um, the place of Germany in that international uh, order. Um, we'll have a, uh, both speakers speak. And then I would point you to the um, Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And uh, please, if you have questions, you can enter them there for um, the conversation then after our two speakers. Um, Professor Mao. Thank you very much, Gail, and thank you very much, uh, Jeff, uh, for having me and for the kind introduction. Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you may be to you. It's nice to be with you virtually. It's still a somewhat strange sensation, but I guess we all get used to it. I want today to talk only about uh, Germany. Mike uh, is going to talk about Japan afterwards, but the background to this, of course, for me and uh, uh, for this event is a book which I've written with several other colleagues on Germany and Japan. We try to compare how Germany and Japan have, particularly in their security policies, um, um, behaved, if you like, uh, during the last 30 years or so. Today I want to talk about the present and the future and about Germany, and this is what I intend to do. A way of introduction of our discussions, I want to take you through six steps. And uh, Liz, if you could see those six steps uh, next, uh, I'll start with the state of bilateral relations between Germany and the United States. Then focus on the core features briefly on German foreign policy, 
pre-corona pandemic, but they haven't really changed, uh, I will argue. They continue to be the same. I will offer a few thoughts on understanding German foreign policy, look at the changes in the international context, and then focus on where Germany stands now with regard to the international order and its evolution in the future. And I call this the multilateralist dilemma. This is where Germany finds itself. And I'll close by a few observations on whether there's a way out for Germany of this dilemma. Now let's start with the state of bilateral relations and what opinion poll data tell us about the state of bilateral relations. And I suspect that some of you are particularly interested in Germany may have seen those poll, poll figures which suggest that uh, for, from the German point of view, having close relations with China, 36% in favor of that, is as important as having close relations with the United States, 37%. In fact, you also see below the picture for the respondents in the United States, it's not, not all that different. Uh, there's also pretty sort of equal feelings towards having closer relations with Germany and the United States. Now, what the, do those, and I go to the next slide, Liz, what do those uh, opinion poll data tell us? Frankly, I think nothing much. You need to take a closer look at those data. They are very misleading. I don't really know what the people who gave those answers had in their minds. But if you look more closely at opinion poll data, you find quite a different picture. And I'm referring here to a Pew uh, survey done in March 2020, so also very recent. And uh, one of the striking differences between Germany and the United States in this poll is that 75% of Americans think the relations with Germany are good, while 64%, so three quarters, but two thirds of Germans think that the relationship is bad. Americans are far more in favor of using military force to maintain international order, more than uh, three, third, uh, uh, three quarters, 78% agree with this notion, 52% of the Germans oppose that notion. And twice as many Germans consider close relations with the United States as more important than with China. So in this opinion poll, taken a few weeks earlier possibly, uh, you have a quite different picture and I think a more realistic picture as to where the Germans stand. So the bottom line here is use opinion poll data with a considerable degree of caution. I think there's a fundamental difference between the relation, the bilateral relationship of China, uh, of Germany with China, to that of Germany with the United States. And it has to do with the depth of history, the cultural affinity, and the enormous degree of economic interdependence, which is not just not com comparable to what you have, admittedly, also a very close economic interdependence with the Chinese market, but it is a different quality. So why do you have this seeming inclination towards equidistance, which came across in the first opinion poll data? I think those data do reflect an important reality. And I would focus on two aspects of this important reality. The, what I call the opening Atlantic divide. I think the Atlantic has become considerably deeper over the last three or four decades, in fact. Uh, put differently, what you have is uh, America and Germany have been changing along different trajectories. Uh, and if you like, uh, uh, America today is a less European country from a European perspective than it used to be 30 or 40 years ago, or at least as it was seen 30 or 40 years ago. And then, of course, you have a particular objection by many Germans to this US president and also the state of the federal government. This is something which troubles many Germans, and this is reflected in the opinion poll data which we have heard about and seen before. So behind that, I think there is uh, another layer, and the one which concerns us here. You have two fundamentally different perspectives on foreign policy between Germany and the United States. And this is particularly true, of course, about this presidency in the United States, and the difference here is between a transactional approach to international relations and foreign policy versus a multilateralist approach to foreign policy and international relations. And behind those fundamentally different perspectives on foreign policy, you have 
something deeper yet, you have what I would argue is a transatlantic values gap. These fundamentally different perspectives are importantly not only about interests, they are also about norms and values. And from the German perspective, the question is, is this American government still committed to the famous Western, Western values, which allegedly are at the bottom of our cooperation? So can America still be considered part of the West? And if not, where, is, where does that leave Germany? Uh, it seems to me that over the last uh, years or so, Germany has basically stood still while the United States has moved away from the past and from this sort of consensus about Western values. Uh, stood still is perhaps putting it a bit too strongly, but I think that's a lot more continuity than change in German foreign policy, which is not true, of course, for the United States. So let's take a closer look at German foreign policy continuity. And the next slide here. Those are the four circles of German foreign policy. The innermost circle is the European Union, European integration. Then you have the transatlantic relationship, the pan European sphere, which includes the whole Eurasian continent and importantly Russia, of course. And then finally, you have the global sphere. And in that, you have as a particular dimension of significant importance recently the German and the EU China relationship. So this is a kind of bird's eye view on German foreign policy, with apologies for my rather mediocre skills in visual representation. So we have four concentric and partly overlapping circles in German foreign policy. Let's take the next slide here and look at some basic features of German foreign policy. Uh, the core uh, circle, as I said, is European integration. This is the most important multilateral, multilateral anchor for German then you have the security anchor, the transatlantic alliance, multilateral anchor two. Then you have the stability anchor, the pan-European framework, and finally commerce and international order, the global sphere. And in each of these four concentric circles, we have key partners. For Europe, this is France. For security, this is the United States. Uh, in the pan-European domain, it's Russia and in international commerce and international order, arguably, apart from the United States, it's China today. So let's take the next slide and try to understand why you have such an enormous degree of continuity in German foreign policy. Uh, so a, a relatively little change. Now, uh, one important explanation for that is simply success. Past German foreign, even West German foreign policy has been remarkably successful, and United German foreign policy since 1990 again has been by and large remarkably successful. And this has, of course, supported this policy of kind of experimental, cautious adjustment. Wherever you need to make changes, uh, absolutely you make them, but by and large you are averse to change. And there is this culture of reticence, also the culture, the culture that's overcome. Gail mentioned that already in her introduction. This is the civilian side of Germany as an international power, if you like. And this culture of reticence towards the use of military force is still very relevant today. Why is this the case? Well, I would argue this simply reflects the foreign policy identity, the national identity and the foreign policy role concept of Germany as a civilian power. This role concept has been successful and has been deeply anchored now uh, through socialization processes in Germany. Secondly, we have consensus-driven domestic politics. We've had grand coalition governments for most of the time recently, and Angela Merkel has been chancellor since, since 2005, for a very long time, continuity in power. Mm -hmm. And the changes in the international environment have been limited, relatively limited, which again has work in favor of foreign policy continuity, but there have been modifications. There have been important policy modifications in certain areas, particularly in the realm of security mm -hmm. and defense policy, and also in the realm of European integration. There have been significant changes. Now, in recent years, the external context has changed quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, we, have, uh, we are beginning, uh, so since 2005, we have confronted in Europe and in the world an increasingly turbulent international context. 
So uh, you've had a number of problems and crises in European integration of the Franco-German time. You had process of political decay. We can explore that further if you like in the discussion. I'll just flag this theme here that the European integration has been running into problems of overstretch and too much success. We've had a lack of political form in a reform in France until very recently. And now this reform process seems to be stalled by the pandemic. And uh, a lack of support for France from Germany and a lack of activation of the cooperation between France and Germany within the European Union, within European integration. Leadership issues have arisen in, German, uh, in European integration. And we've had a number of European democracies falling into more or less serious problems of change, domestic political change and decay. Uh, the catalyst of many of these changes has been, of course, the Eurozone crisis and its aftermath. So things have not been particularly uh, easy in Europe since 2005 or so, uh, and the same has been true for the Transatlantic Trans Alliance. The first big fallout, of course, in 2003, uh, and more recently, the issues of political decay in America's democracy. Uh, in retrospect, it seems as if the Obama years were exceptional, and his presidency certainly was insufficient to reverse the decay problems which had existed already before. Let's look at the next slide. Uh, we have a Cold War, a new Cold War descending on Europe uh, uh, as a result of Russia's uh, annexation of the Crimea um, and the failure of the modernization partnership uh, with Russia, the consolidation of the reign of, of Vladimir Putin. We have uh, observed a disintegrating international national order with a slow unraveling of the international trade order, WTO order, the international nuclear order, and I could go on. Uh, a number of uh, uh, international, in fact, it's hard to find international institutions which are not in crisis at this point in time or have been in crisis for quite some time already. And we've had growing tensions in both the pan-European and the in East Asian regional orders. And the Middle Eastern order has all but fallen apart. And finally, we have had the rise of China, of course, and so in an increasingly huge shadow, which is also beginning to touch Germany. And I think the two wake-up calls for Germany in that context were the industry in 2025 program in China, the pursuit of uh, mercantilist industrial policies, uh, with the aim to uh, uh, control the commanding heights of industry. And that would include the industrial sectors which are traditionally Germany's, Germany's strength. And what's happening inside uh, China in terms of policies of social control. The catalyst for the new attitudes towards China has been the takeover by China of KUKA, a robot constructor, a medium-sized enterprise in Germany. Okay, let's move to the multilateralized dilemma. I mentioned that the core of, uh, for understanding Germany's foreign policy is this concept of multilateralism, the idea of more precisely uh, a rules-based and open international order, which is crucial for Germany, and it is crucial for Japan as well, for those medium-sized powers. They need this kind of international environment, uh, uh, a rules-based open international order, but this is increasingly demanding and difficult to realize. And what you need from a multilateralist point of view, if you want to be a successful multilateralist, you need partners. You need partners who are willing to uphold that particular approach to foreign policy and uphold this notion of international order. You need vibrant international institutions. You need domestic political support, of course, for your foreign policies. And you need international legitimacy. And all these issues from Germany's perspective have become increasingly questionable, increasingly uncertain. Who are Germany's partners? France, of course, but France and West France. To what extent is France still available as a partner? How well are the international institutions doing, which Germany needs, starting from the WTO, uh, United Nations? I mean, are these institutions still functioning the way they should? And indeed, you could also ask, 
to what extent Germany is a good multilateralist itself. And perhaps the key to being a good multilateralist, from my point of view, is the notion of diffuse reciprocity, that you're willing to compromise your own interests because you assume that your partners in the future will reciprocate at some point. So is there a way out of this dilemma? Which, which uh, ways could that be? Will Germany adapt and change its foreign policy stripes? And if so, in which way? Uh, will it become more of a military power, as some American observers uh, demand? Uh, yes, to some extent, but don't expect too much. Don't hold your breath. Uh, there will be modest increases in defense spending, and they are bad, desperately needed because the Bundeswehr is in very bad shape. Uh, something is going to be done about this, but uh, do not expect Germany to become a major military power. It will not. It's not uh, conceivable under present circumstances. Will Germany be able to dominate the European Union uh, as a kind of hegemon? It's too big for that. Unlikely. Perhaps on certain issues areas, but overall, no just doesn't have the wherewithal for that. Its position is strong, but not strong enough for that within the European Union. Could the European Union become a fortress? I think this is plausible. There are tendencies and trends already that you can see in this direction. And um, that those forces may be given more support by the pandemic. That could be enhanced. Mm. Could Germany fall in line with China, just become a kind of appendix, uh, you know, the, the point where the belt and road, the, the, the belt ends in Duisburg? Um, conceivable to me, it's plausible if the European Union really falls apart, disintegrates. And could Germany go it alone finally? Perhaps in a core Europe, if the European Union really would disintegrate, it is conceivable that you would end up with a group of uh, countries sympathetic to Germany and dependent on Germany economically, uh, and that this would uh, then try to survive uh, as well as it can under the circumstances in a, in a difficult international environment. There's also the possibility, and I think this is certainly what German foreign policy aims at, to double down on multilateralism. Uh, and the Alliance for Multilateralism, a new network of cooperation which has been set up last September, uh, is appointed in this direction. There's also a white paper under preparation by the German government on multilateralism. Germany will certainly try very hard to continue on this track of multilateralism and do what it can to retain a rules-based open international order. And it will look above all to the European Union and try to turn the European into a global player uh, in this sense and this direction. Now, uh, looking at this picture and looking at the future, it strikes me really how critically important the next eight months are. Until January 20th, uh, 2021, uh, uh, there will be the American presidential election and the transition period, and then you'll have a new or the same president being inaugurated. And uh, in the second half of 2020, you'll have the German presidency in the European Union. And during this period, the budget for the next six years will have to be negotiated. Tremendously uh, important period in European politics always, and particularly at this time. So uh, by the end of this year, we'll see how well Germany will be able to play this role as a multilateralist, as a successful uh, multilateralist in defense of a rules-based international order. It's going to be a, a tough act to pursue. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Hans. And uh, to uh, reinforce that, I would direct you all to his recent book uh, from Brookings, uh, Reluctant Warriors, Germany, Japan, and their U.S. Alliance Dilemma. And he's also just published uh, in the new survival, June, July, um, Germany, uh, Japan, and the fate of international order. So uh, I direct you to that. Hans is, uh, holds the chair for foreign policy and international relations or held it at the University of Trier uh, in Germany. And he now teaches at the SAIS uh, Johns Hopkins in Bologna, Italy. 
and he's a senior distinguished fellow at the uh, Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik in Berlin, as you could see on the edges of his uh, presentation, uh, the SVP. Let me turn now, and I'm very pleased uh, to have with us today um, Michael um, Mozizuki, and uh, he holds the Japan uh, chair at the uh, Elliott School of International Affairs at uh, George Washington University right here in town. And that may be it right behind him. Uh, he's the co-director of the M Memory and Reconciliation in Asia and Pacific uh, uh, Research. He's uh, working on a policy project of the Sigur uh, Center. Uh, previously, he was a senior fellow at uh, Brookings uh, Institution. He was the co-director of the Center for Asia-Pacific Policy at RAND, and he's taught at both the University of Southern California and Yale University. So it's, uh, again, with great pleasure that uh, I ask Mike to take the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Gail. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to participate in this uh, program. Uh, it is uh, really an honor to appear on the same program with uh, Hans Moll. Uh, some 30 years ago, uh, I read uh, his essay in Foreign Affairs entitled uh, Germany and Japan, uh, the New Civilian Powers. And uh, that essay really had a, a major intellectual impact on me and it continues to shape uh, the way uh, that I not only compare Japan uh, and Germany, but to think through uh, the strategic options and dilemmas that Japan faces uh, in its own region uh, in East Asia. Uh, because uh, of the limited time, uh, what I would like to do is to limit my remarks to basically three uh, points or issues. Uh, first uh, is uh, my take on what people call Japan's security normalization or remilitarization, and I wanted to emphasize the limits of Japan's normalization or remilitarization. Uh, secondly, uh, I wanted to address the issue of Japan's foreign policy autonomy and international leadership uh, in the context of the US-Japan alliance. And then uh, finally, uh, to uh, think about uh, Japan's strategic choices at a time of intensifying US-China competition and uncertainties uh, regarding the international order uh, which uh, Hans Moll uh, so eloquently uh, uh, analyzed. Uh, first, uh, in terms of Japan's security normalization or remilitarization, uh, it's clear uh, that uh, since the early 1980s, uh, Japan has incrementally relaxed uh, its self-imposed constraints on defense uh, policy. And under Prime Minister uh, Shinzo Abe, uh, this trend has accelerated uh, to some extent, and one can list a number of indicators of this. Uh, Japan rescinded uh, the three uh, principles that restricted arms exports. Uh, in July 2014, uh, Prime Minister Abe reinterpreted uh, the Constitution, uh, and, and then a year later uh, passed a really a breathtaking uh, package of new laws uh, regarding security policy. Uh, also, after Prime Minister Abe became uh, Prime Minister again in 2012, December 2012, he has increased, uh, in absolute terms, Japanese defense expenditures after many years of decline. Uh, and then, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the Abe government uh, passed uh, a, a defense uh, uh, spending uh, plan uh, in which uh, Japan decided that it would procure uh, potential offensive attack capability, uh, ranging from cruise missiles, uh, hypersonic glide projectile, and to convert uh, its uh, uh, Izumo helicopter carrier uh, so that it could carry uh, F-35 uh, fighter planes. And then also, uh, Japan has reached out beyond the United States uh, to develop security relationships with other countries uh, like Australia, India, uh, Vietnam, and the Philippines. So this all fits into the narrative of uh, Japanese security normalization or even uh, remilitarization. Um, but I take the view that we should also emphasize or be aware of the 
clear limitations of this uh, trend. So for example, uh, the July 2014 constitutional reinterpretation. Although some people like to say this, that to say that Japan through this reinterpretation embraced collective self-defense, I see it more as a modest expansion of the concept of the right of individual self-defense into the realm of a collective self-defense. It is a full, a full, uh, far short of a full embrace of collective self-defense is very different uh, from the, the defense parameters of countries in NATO, including uh, Germany. Uh, secondly, although the geographic scope of Japan's self-defense force activities has uh, clearly expanded, there are still very robust restrictions on the use of force uh, by the self-defense forces uh, in missions beyond the defense of Japan uh, uh, proper. Uh, even in terms of the acquisition of systems with potential for offensive strikes against the territory of adversaries, Japan still is uh, very far from having an effective autonomous offensive, uh, preemptive or retaliatory strike capability. In fact, many of these so-called offensive capabilities would probably be used to defend Japan from east of the first island chain where the self-defense forces might be less vulnerable uh, to Chinese missile threats. And finally, although uh, Japanese defense expenditures have begun uh, to increase absolutely in absolute terms um, uh, after Prime Minister Abe returned uh, to power, they still are around 1% of GDP. And I think it will be very difficult uh, for the uh, Abe government to really push beyond the 1% of GDP uh, ceiling, despite the fact that the Japanese government in the early 1980s formally rescinded uh, that ceiling. So there's really a, a, a clear limitation to Japan's so-called security uh, normalization. Now turning to the second issue about uh, Japanese autonomy and uh, leadership. Uh, you know, there's often an image that Japan is primarily a reactive state uh, a state that tends to defer or follow the United States. But we should remember that Japan has often uh, engaged in diplomatic activism uh, despite uh, resistance from the United States. And this has a long history, uh, starting from the late 1950s. Uh, and, and there's evidence for that. Uh, uh, Japan pushed for the, for the Asian Development Bank despite initial uh, US resistance. Uh, Japan promoted uh, uh, the establishment of the Asia Pacific Economic uh, Cooperation Forum, uh, and then it promoted uh, a region-wide security uh, forum, uh, a security dialogue, which came to be known as the ASEAN Regional Forum. Uh, Japan promoted the Asian Monetary Fund after the 1997 East Asian financial crisis. The United States opposed that, but in the end, the Japanese uh, forged ahead, and then you have after that uh, a Chiang Mai initiative and the emergence of an ASEAN plus three dialogue. And then uh, Japan uh, was a key promoter of a region-wide uh, trade negotiation, uh, which became the Regional Comprehensive Economic uh, Partnership uh, discussion. So the Japanese, although it has tend to uh, follow the United States, has also exerted a certain amount of leadership and this has been leadership uh, from behind. Uh, for example, it got Australia to take the formal lead in establishing APEC. And then it's also focused on ASEAN centrality and promoting uh, the multilateral security uh, dialogue that became the ASEAN Regional Forum. And then now uh, uh, the RCEP uh, uh, trade process. Now this kind of autonomy or leadership has become more pronounced under Prime Minister Abe. Uh, you know, he has been promoting his idea of a free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, he has pushed ahead with capacity building uh, for maritime security among some of the Southeast Asian countries, especially the Philippines and Vietnam. Uh, after the US withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, uh, Prime Minister Abe, Abe took the initiative with the remaining countries in TPP uh, to finalize the CPTPP, the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. 
Also, in an answer uh, to China's uh, AIIB initiative, uh, Prime Minister Abe ha has announced a partnership for quality infrastructure uh, in Asia, uh, and the amount is, uh, is about $115 billion. Uh, and then there's also uh, uh, evidence of Japanese foreign policy autonomy uh, in, in the way as Abe has, has reached out to Russia, has met over 25 times uh, with Vladimir Putin. Uh, he's even tried to find degrees of freedom uh, regarding Iranian uh, 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 diplomacy, although both on Russia and Iran, they have yet to bear uh, fruit. Now, there is a certain paradox about Japanese foreign policy autonomy and leadership. Uh, the United States is hypersensitive about being excluded or diminished in the Asia uh, Pacific. And so paradoxically, in order for Japan to exert auto autonomy and leadership uh, in Asia, it has to first reassure the United States about Japan's commitment uh, to the security alliance uh, with uh, the United States. And without that reassurance, uh, then any initiative that the uh, Japanese take, the United States will resist and will probably uh, try to stop. And I think this was the strategic mistake uh, that Prime Minister Hatoyama made uh, back in 2009 when he pursued uh, the notion of an East Asian community, which I think uh, uh, you know, was was a very positive initiative, uh, but the United States came down hard against it uh, because uh, he did not reassure uh, the United States. Now, finally, uh, on the issue of Japan's strategic uh, choices or, or in fact, dilemmas in an era of U.S.-China strategic competition and uncertainties in the international order, uh, I think uh, it is misguided to think uh, that the United States should harness Japan and other Asian allies in a strategy of containing China's rise. Mm -hmm. uh, for reasons of geography, economic interests, history and security realities, Japan does not want a full-blown conflictual relationship between the United States and China in which Japan is forced to choose between these two countries and gets entrapped in a US-China military conflict. Now, of course, uh, Japan is acutely concerned about China's growing military power and its assertiveness. But Japan ultimately seeks a way to coexist peacefully with China. And this has been clear even under Prime Minister Abe, who is probably one of the most nationalist prime ministers in recent memory, uh, because under Abe, he has pursued a process of cautious rapprochement with uh, China. And so for the coming decade, you know, whether or not Trump is reelected or is defeated in November, uh, Japan faces the strategic dilemma posed by the increasingly competitive relationship between China uh, and the United States. And I think the key challenge for Japan is what role Japan can play uh, to moderate US-Chinese strategic uh, competition. Now, one answer to this has been the so-called free and open Indo-Pacific uh, idea. Uh, although there are a lot of uh, positive elements of FOIA, uh, the free and open Indo-Pacific, I do not think that it is sufficient uh, uh, for this major strategic task. It's not sufficient uh, for three reasons. Uh, it, it gives the mistaken impression that Japan will gladly join a US-led coalition to contain China and to decouple from China. And absolutely, uh, that is not in Japan's interest. Secondly, I think the free and open Indo-Pacific idea uh, overestimates the positive contribution that India can make and underestimates the strategic importance of South Korea. And then finally, the problem with FOIA is that it Im implicitly embraces without much critical reflection, the notion of a US-led liberal and rules-based order and the problematic role, not only of China, but also the problematic role of the United States uh, as we see uh, today. So uh, to kind of uh, pivot off of Hans Moll's 
notion of is there a way out? Well, I would propose that Japan uh, might pursue um, kind of two avenues or, or three avenues. One is that Japan's role is becoming increasingly important in US military strategy and operations in the Asia Pacific. Uh, and therefore, this gives Japan an opportunity to have a greater voice uh, in the alliance relationship with the United States and even de facto veto power. So the question is whether Japan is willing uh, to exercise uh, uh, that voice and perhaps veto power. Uh, the second thing is that I think Japan should take the lead in pursuing what some people have called middle power uh, diplomacy. Now, not just working with uh, the ASEAN states or Australia and New Zealand, uh, but also with South Korea. Uh, and then uh, uh, to enhance diplomatic coordination uh, with countries in Europe, especially uh, Germany uh, and uh, France. Now, I'm afraid that in terms of promoting relations with South Korea, uh, that might have to await uh, uh, the post-Abe area uh, era. And then finally, uh, I think that Japan, rather than being wedded to the myth of a US-led uh, liberal international order, uh, Japan should work uh, to promote multilateral international cooperation across uh, uh, numerous functional issues. Hans Moll referred to uh, the notion of what is the purpose of the order? Well, the purpose of the order is basically to address some of the pressing global challenges uh, that we face, uh, such as climate uh, change. And unfortunately, not only has U.S. relative power declined, uh, but America's moral authority has declined. And I think this uh, makes it imperative uh, that Japan uh, step up to this challenge and work with other countries, other like-minded countries, especially countries in, in Europe and in, in, East, in East Asia, uh, to feel, uh, fill this crisis of U.S. Uh, moral authority in international affairs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I think we've had two excellent uh, presentations, very uh, full presentations. And um, I would uh, just like to um, uh, mention that again, that we uh, do have uh, under Q&A, the possibility to um, uh, pose your questions, but please try to pose them very uh, succinctly. Uh, so that uh, we can get through uh, as many um, reactions and all and questions uh, to the uh, uh, to the panelists. Um, let me uh, start um, with uh, Jeff. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much, Gail. Um, uh, thanks to for these two excellent uh, presentations. Um, I wanted to ask a question to Han. Um, you identified the next eight months as a crucial period, and, and I think certainly uh, the, the you know, events that will take place in that time are crucial. But I wonder uh, about, uh, you know, it seems to me that that time horizon might be longer because we have a political transition in Germany. Um, we, have, we will have a new leader of the Christian Democratic Union. Um, there will be a different chancellor candidate from uh, the CDU, CSU. And there will probably be a different governing coalition after the 2021 election. And, and so, um, you know, while there has been an emphasis on multilateralism in German foreign policy for understandable reasons that you explained, I, th I can't help but be struck by the passivity with which Germany is approaching these uh, deep changes in the international order that have such uh, an impact on Germany's security and its entire foreign policy model. So do you see the potential for more fundamental changes, at least a greater creativity and activism on the part of Germany uh, on the horizon, perhaps not in eight months, but in 18 months? Thanks, Jeff, very good questions. Uh, um, I share your concern about what you call passivity. Uh, that's a bit strong, this term, but I think uh, I understand what you described with that, and I share that. Uh, I, this is going to um, probably change somewhat, but not fundamentally, uh, in the longer term uh, with the political transition, which you indicated. 
Uh, first of all, I would say on that, while Angela Merkel so far has firmly uh, said she would step down in, in the fall of 21, I'm not 100% certain that this is going to happen yet. She sort of has a, a second spring at the moment and uh, a very strong position as leader. We'll see how that goes. But even assuming it plays out the way uh, it seems to at the moment, I would expect some change uh, politically, but nothing very fundamental. And the change which I, would, which I would expect to see at the moment, I think the most likely coalition government which would emerge would be a green-black coalition government, CDU, CSU, and the Greens. And that would give welcome new impulses uh, to German policies across the board, possibly including foreign policy, but it's not in itself enough to create the kind of dramatic change which you seem to have in mind and which one might wish for uh, if, if uh, you know, one wanted to see a really committed uh, multilateralist uh, Germany. Thank you for the question. Mike? <laughs> well, um, I was just reading the, uh, 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 some of the questions that were posted and, and some from uh, very good friends of mine. Uh, but a, a lot of them uh, uh, focused on the issue of, of how Japan uh, and Germany uh, can uh, work with multilateral institutions to uh, manage the rise of China. And, and uh, to what extent will Japan place a greater priority on diplomacy with third countries uh, that are uh, aligned with the United States versus working uh, uh, with uh, 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 China. Uh, uh, well, uh, first, I, I think it's important to distinguish between kind of multilateral institutions uh, like the United Nations, the IMF, uh, the World Bank, or the World Health uh, Organization. Now, those institutions uh, are under attack uh, by the United States uh, today. And there's always been a, a certain kind of reluctance on the part of the United States uh, to support these institutions, ironically, that the United States helped to forge uh, after uh, World War uh, II. Uh, so certainly, I think the uh, Japanese have a major stake in kind of buttressing those uh, uh, institutions. But I think in terms of Japanese diplomacy, the real action is not so much in terms of multilateral institutions, but regional processes. And so, for example, uh, you know, what's going on uh, in the wake of the United States departure from uh, TPP is very significant. Uh, uh, Japan's promotion of the CPTPP, uh, and then now uh, RCEP, uh, and then uh, developing the trade deal uh, with the EU. I mean, these aren't kind of formal standing institutions, but these are very important uh, processes that uh, are designed uh, 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 to pursue economic interests, but to manage the rise of China, not by ex excluding uh, China, uh, but trying to bring, uh, bring China in and socialize China uh, into a much more uh, open uh, trade policy uh, and economic uh, practices. And so I think uh, Japan will, uh, uh, will keep pushing on that front uh, and should uh, continue to push on that front. Uh, in terms of uh, the relative weight of Japan uh, having uh, diplomatic initiatives with third uh, countries versus uh, with uh, China, I, I think uh, the obvious answer is both, and it, it will be done uh, both uh, equally. Uh, but what really Japan needs to do is uh, to see that it is in Japan's strategic enlightened strategic interest uh, to repair the damage uh, in Japan-South Korean uh, relations. Because if middle power diplomacy is to be uh, at all effective, uh, South Korea uh, uh, is a, a much more dynamic uh, economy than most of the other states uh, in East Asia. And to have uh, had such a problematic bilateral relationship uh, with Japan's closest neighbor, which happens to be a democracy and also an ally of the United States, I think is, is a, uh, a, a major uh, strategic deficit for Japan. So I see that that as one of the most uh, acute uh, challenges uh, for Japanese foreign policy. 
Mike, uh, you just uh, addressed uh, South Korea, uh, and I agree with you. Um, one uh, country that uh, you haven't addressed is North Korea. And um, I was hoping that maybe you would have a comment about uh, where you see North Korea uh, going and uh, how Japan can uh, deal with this uh, fairly aggressive uh, country there uh, right in your region. Okay. Well, uh, in terms of North Korea, my, my views on, on North Korea are somewhat different from the mainstream. I believe uh, that the United States and, and other countries, uh, including Japan and South Korea, have missed many opportunities uh, to try uh, to uh, stop uh, uh, North Korea's uh, nuclear programs. And, and, you know, it would take a conference on its own uh, uh, to uh, go through that. Uh, but one thing is that the United States, Japan, uh, uh, and uh, South Korea have rarely been in sync uh, in terms of a coordinated, united, cohesive uh, policy towards North, North Korea. And I think the other thing is that the United States has repeatedly made this mistake uh, that the, role, the solution to the North Korean issue is through Beijing, that by having China put pressure on North Korea, somehow this, uh, this will be uh, solved. And I think uh, it has not worked, uh, but uh, uh, too many continue to think uh, China uh, is uh, the answer. I think at the end of the day, uh, what's important is, the, is to try to understand the motivation for North Korea's nuclear uh, uh, program. Now, certainly, uh, North Korea is in interested in status, but I think the key thing is North Korea is interested in security. Uh, and so uh, Japan needs to work uh, with South Korea uh, to try to persuade the United States uh, the importance of, uh, of security reassurance to North Korea uh, in order for North Korea to move uh, towards abandoning uh, mm -hmm. its nuclear their uh, weapons uh, program. Mm -hmm. uh, Hans, uh, while we're on um, uh, the nuclear question, so to speak, uh, AICGS advisor had a debate over uh, this question for Germany um, in last week's uh, edition. Um, and I was just wondering if you had any, not directly necessarily to the advisor discussion, but uh, yourself on Germany and this question that recently has been coming up over uh, what direction should Germany take um, you know, on the nuclear issue? I think that's uh, tied obviously to the broader issue of the future of the NATO alliance. And personally, I think it's very unwise for Germany at this time, at this stage, to sort of open uh, this debate. Uh, you know, this comes from a particular uh, end of the political spectrum. Essentially, some uh, people in the SPD, even within the SPD, there is opposition to that uh, for reopening this issue. I can understand that on substance. I mean, the nuclear strategy is somewhat strange, but the, fundament the most fundamental issue, in my view, is uh, that Germany at this stage should not uh, sort of Try it's to take its own distance from an alliance which, which is in trouble anyway already because of the leadership uh, in Washington uh, in the alliance is problematic. So, uh, you know, to complicate this issue further at this stage, I think is very unwise, and I'm very unhappy about this. Thank you. Um, I'll, let me take uh, maybe this final question since you uh, broached uh, also the U.S. administration, and that is, if VP Biden is elected president in November, what is your specific advice to him uh, on, um, on uh, where, what issues he should pick up in, on and on which uh, uh, issues do you think there would be a difference were there to be uh, Obama or were there to be Trump uh, elected? Uh, this question is to me. Start, Hans. Yeah, you want to start. Where, what would you, if you were his advisor, what would you say to? Uh, each of them? Well, I just answered this question also in written uh, while you were putting it. Uh, you know, my my answer is if Joe Biden does what he said he would do in his foreign affairs piece, this would be a very good start. Mm -hmm. I mean, and my perception is that the policies, the foreign policies of the Obama administration and the Trump administration are almost diametrically opposite. So going back uh, in a way to the Obama administration's foreign policies 
of you know cultivating alliances and allies the reliability responsibility that would be very good mm -hmm, mm -hmm. mike do you have a question on that what would you advise biden and and uh where do you think uh, uh the relationship should go uh where trump to stay yeah yeah well, well, first of all, you know, I, I agree that there is a big difference between Trump uh, and uh, Biden. Uh, but when you think about China policy, mm -hmm. uh, even under a Biden administration, I think uh, U.S.-China relations are going to be fraught with tension uh, and, and uh, intens intensifying uh, uh, competition. Uh, and uh, uh, the Biden campaign uh, and, and all Democratic candidates have emphasized the importance of alliances uh, and going against unilateralism. Well, my advice uh, to a President uh, Biden is that uh, take very seriously uh, uh, that notion. Uh, don't give lip service uh, uh, to uh, focusing on the importance of alliances. And this really means uh, to listen uh, to carefully uh, to what uh, the countries in Asia uh, say uh, about China. I mean, most of the countries in Asia are very, very concerned about China's uh, behavior and rising uh, power, uh, but uh, they don't want uh, a military conflict between the United States and China. And so I think uh, Asian countries, uh, because they are there in the region, uh, may have uh, uh, some good advice uh, for how to manage the relationship with China. Uh, and I think the Biden administration to take uh, to take very seriously uh, those views uh, emanating uh, uh, from our uh, Asian allies. Thank you. Thank you both. I think we're out of time, um, but if either of you would like to, uh, I'll start with Hans, if you would like to make a final uh, comment. Um, uh, I'm coming back to this notion of how critical the next eight months are going to be. I continue to be impressed by that uh, and I think uh, we will be a lot uh, wiser uh, about the future. We will know more about the future once we are through this eight-month period uh, of transition in the European Union uh, and in uh, the United States domestic politics. Um, Mike, did you have a final comment you'd like to make? Well, um you know, there, there's no question that uh, Japan's relative power uh, has declined relative uh, to China. Uh, and therefore, it's in order for Japan uh, to regain the confidence uh, so that it can take a leadership role in shaping the regional order in China, it really needs not only to look to the United States, uh, but look uh, uh, to uh, other countries uh, uh, in uh, the Asia Pacific uh, for for partnerships. I mean, that is really going to be uh, the, the critical uh, thing. And the United States uh, should not become hypersensitive about uh, such moves because in the in the end, uh, this will serve uh, America's uh, enlightened uh, self-interest. Well, uh, a virtual uh, round of applause for both of you. Thank you so much for um, very interesting comments um, and insightful comments. And I think that uh, especially both of your comments there at the end show us that it's gonna be an interesting next six to eight months uh, for all of us. Thank you uh, to the audience uh, for your questions and, uh, and to the speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.